I've been playing video games for as long as I can possibly remember. One of my earliest memories involves playing Pokemon Yellow on my Game Boy Color before I could even read any of the text on screen. Because of this, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what the first video game I ever played was, but I do remember playing a select few. I was born in 1996, the same year the Nintendo 64 released in North America. However, a few years passed before I received that console as a gift. Before then, my family owned a second-hand SNES. Among a handful of licensed games that failed to leave a lasting impression on me because of their obtuse rules and design were two other games that, when played in conjunction, would cement my love for gaming for years to come. One of them featured some apes and a whole lot of monkey business, but before that came Super Mario World. It was the first video game I played that featured a character and world I wasn't already familiar with. A short, mustachioed man with a red cap and overalls, running and jumping through environments that changed dramatically from level to level. In the span of just four stages, I'd traversed a dense forest, numerous mountaintops, a vast lake, and a menacing castle full of lava pits and crushing pillars. The conveyance of its levels or lack thereof was striking, but it didn't need to make sense because they were fun to play from front to back free from the shackles of unintuitive design that bogged down the other games in our SNES library. Essentially, Super Mario World taught me what a video game should be, instilling initial interest. But Donkey Kong Country? Donkey Kong Country taught me what a video game could be. My experience playing the original Donkey Kong Country trilogy differs from my time with any other game because it's a story about how I grew up while playing them. Not at the time of each of their releases, but at wildly different stages of my life where my evolving habits influenced how I understood them. For a series of games released year after year on the same hardware and engine, one might believe the changes each release underwent would be negligible. But after playing all three repeatedly in order to better understand them, I can say for certain that each entry in the original Donkey Kong Country trilogy exists to serve a unique purpose. I want to try to explain what I think that is. So let's start at the beginning, because the original DKC is the only one of the three that can transport me directly back to my childhood, where I had little care or thought for anything else besides what inhabited the screen in front of me. The original Donkey Kong Country is a product of all of its immersive qualities combined to create a visual and auditory experience so ahead of its time that it is still remembered as such today, decades after its release. Although I played Super Mario World and DKC at the same time, the latter casts a much wider wave of nostalgia over me even from the moment I booted up, greeted by that iconic Rareware splash screen. That's not to say that Super Mario World falters where DKC succeeds. In fact, according to lead designer Greg Mails, Donkey Kong Country would not exist in its current form if not for Super Mario Bros. serving as inspiration. It's just that Donkey Kong Country was able to iterate on the formula established by Nintendo's developers in its own way. In Super Mario World, most, if not all, aspects of the game's design serve a fluid gameplay experience, whereas Donkey Kong Countries serve to better enhance its immersion. The most obvious example is how each game handles its HUD elements. In Super Mario World, they're always on screen during gameplay. In DKC, some of these elements are present, but they only appear for brief moments before sliding off screen, keeping the player's focus on its breathtaking environments and obstacles ahead. The truth is, Donkey Kong Country thrives in its simplicity because it's able to put a spotlight on its unique strengths. Its mechanical structure isn't too different from other platforming juggernauts released at the time, but its twist on these core elements were what set it apart, amplified by its graphical innovations and extraordinary soundtrack. This is what captivated me as a child. Super Mario World felt like a natural extension of the cartoons I had grown accustomed to branching into the video game world, but DKC felt different due to its dedication to conveying a sense of realism. It can even be felt as early as the first level, 
jungle hijinks. The first time I blasted out of DK's treehouse, all I could do was stare in awe, absorbing the pristine graphical fidelity of the environment, as well as the incredible attention to detail in DK's animations. It was just so much more expressive and charming than anything else I'd played. Jungle Hijinx is about as much of an opening level as one could expect, filled with various enemy types that showcase the strengths and weaknesses of each Kong, an introduction to Animal Buddies, the series take on power-ups, and plenty of optional platforming challenges and secrets that demonstrate some of the core tenets of DKC. Speed, tight platforming, and exploration. But in my opinion, the most interesting promise comes at the very end of the level. Right before reaching its exit, the sun sets on what was once a bouncy, carefree playground, showcasing just a glimpse of what's to come. Entering and exiting the cave presents a similar looking level in an entirely new context, one increasingly more dangerous than the last. Donkey Kong Island is not merely a video game world designed to be played or the conveyance of its levels is contingent on how it will enhance the gameplay, but an attempt at a more convincingly realistic and cohesive world in which the further the Kong stray away from their home, the more at risk they become of exposing themselves to the elements and treachery of the natural landscape. My only problem with this reveal is the fact that both levels feature the same music track, DK Island Swing. I'm of two minds about it. On one hand, it feels like a tonal mismatch and a missed opportunity to really drive home what the players in store for, but on the other, I can understand why the developers didn't want this level to feel too off kilter, because it's merely one level in a much more gradual transition. One that sandwiches the more menacing levels between more familiar and inviting ones during the early game before pulling the same tactic in reverse by the end. In this transition from the bottom of Donkey Kong Island to the top, the Kongs find themselves traversing these pockets of danger between the more familiar jungles, ponds, and caves found in the early game. From derelict mines and dense forests, to mystifying temples and treetop villages. For most of the game, this steady progression into uncharted territory feels more like a romp through Donkey Kong's backyard until suddenly you're greeted by an entirely new and alien landscape. The Gorilla Glacier. Its first level, Snow Barrow Blast welcomes you in with nothing but a low frequency hum for an uncomfortable amount of time as the reality of the situation begins to sink in. The Kongs are unbelievably far away from their home, and the vast abyss beneath their feet ensuring certain doom with one slip, the level's unsettling music, and the gradual increase of its oppressive blizzard's intensity over the course of the level demonstrates this in such an in-your-face sort of way that left me feeling shocked and wondering how I got here. For the unsuspecting player, this level is absolutely brutal in its difficulty. It's typically cited as an awfully dramatic spike in the game's difficulty curve, an example of poor design. And while I tend to agree, there's something beautiful about it. I hate playing it, but I love experiencing it. It is a make or break point, a tonal climax of sorts, where the weak will give up, but the strong will prevail through sheer will and determination. Snow Barrel Blast was as far as I could reach as a child, which is probably why I hold it in such contempt, but being able to revisit it years later and overcome what I once thought was impossible, rewarded with the grace of the following ice caves, unbridled beauty left me with such an inspired feeling, reminding me why I've always held this game in such high regard. It's because Donkey Kong Country tells a story through its landscapes, a story of survival and the trials and tribulations experienced by breaking from one's comfort zone. The change in tone and difficulty is anything but smooth, but for that very reason, it feels less designed, more organic. And while most of my fondest memories with Donkey Kong Country are tied to this feeling it brought me through its ambitious graphical detail, enchanting music, and atmosphere, I cannot understate how satisfying thrilling and addictive its gameplay loop is, due in part to its effort to differentiate itself from the king of 2D platformers, Mario. Donkey Kong Country was designed with strict mechanical intent to be a fast and flowing game as males would describe. One that if played over and over again would allow the player to seamlessly flow through it, a phenomenon that, funnily enough, is facilitated by one simple addition, the roll attack. 
Jumping back to Super Mario World for a moment, I think the reason I don't particularly connect with its gameplay the same way I do with DKC is because of such a move's absence. Between Mario World's relatively floaty feeling jump and slower ramp up and acceleration, at top speed, it typically makes more sense to outright avoid enemies than interact with them at all. If anything, most are hazards meant to be dealt with from a distance. This isn't really the case in DKC, because the jumps feel tighter, and the roll attack's versatility allows enemies to feel less like an obstacle and more like an opportunity to up the pace of play. In certain situations, it's even safer to deal with enemies head-on while taking advantage of the momentum boost they provide than it is to jump on or avoid them. And in what is surely the cherry on top of this ice cream sundae of a gameplay edition, the roll attack is able to be cancelled by jumping during any point of its animation, on or off a ledge. I have always loved this approach to platformer design. Challenging, fast-paced, and fluid gameplay is what has historically driven me to not only enjoy a game, but to master it and experience everything it has to offer. And to a degree, Donkey Kong Country succeeds in its attempt to demonstrate Males' vision, establishing elements of speed, momentum, and tight control that would remain a core focus of the series for years to come. Unfortunately, as is natural with any first game in a series, a few too many of its design elements would eventually begin to feel a bit outdated. For one, I'm not particularly keen on Donkey Kong's attributes. I like that he offers something unique to Diddy, but his heaviness and wide hitbox makes him difficult to precisely control in some of the game's tougher areas. The implementation of certain animal buddies is also a mixed bag. On Guard and Rambi are fantastic, but I've always struggled to get practical use out of Espresso. And there's this weird inconsistency with how Winky interacts with the edges of platforms and tires on account of her constant hopping. The worst aspect of DKC's design, however, is how the developers utilized screen space. Enemies simply do not telegraph their attacks, and are conveniently positioned off screen to blindside unsuspecting players or punish those playing at a faster pace, which often left me feeling cheated and forced to take a few too many leaps of faith. Elements like this repeatedly disrupt the flow of gameplay, all coming to a head in the final world, Chimp Caverns. It feels like an afterthought in both its tone and gameplay, featuring a series of what were probably experimental levels that take this pace disruption to the extreme, unfortunately ending what was an incredibly innovative game on a somewhat sour note. In spite of its failings, it's a game whose vision left an enormous footprint on my childhood, influencing how I saw video games for years to come. However, this wasn't enough for the developers at Rare. Instead of settling for what Donkey Kong Country was, they did what every elite developer should strive to do. They saw the potential in their creation and decided to push the envelope further, refining what failed while expanding what succeeded to create one of the most polished sequels in Nintendo history, a landmark title for 2D platformers, and one I have a particularly interesting history with, Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest. Donkey Kong Country 2 is one of the most important games I've ever played, but the first time I played it, I hated it. Following my childhood encounter with the original DKC, I moved on to the next generation, blissfully unaware that a sequel to what made me fall in love with video games existed at all. My first encounter with DKC 2 didn't occur until years later, all thanks to my exposure to the internet and emulation. Here I was thinking Donkey Kong 64 was the next step for Donkey Kong Country this whole time, but suddenly there was not one but two sequels to the original at my fingertips. I quickly booted up Donkey Kong Country 2 on the cheap family computer that could barely run anything beyond RuneScape and the old CD-ROMs we had accumulated over the years. No headphones, no controller, just a low resolution screen, blown out speakers, and a generic membrane keyboard as my method of control. This was a surefire way to ruin my experience with DKC2 right off the bat. But setting all that aside, something else didn't sit right with me. When I fell in love with Donkey Kong Country, I fell in love with the setting, the jungle treetops, the frantic mine shafts, the serene waters and dingy caves. I fell in love with the sense of realism that dared to be different from Mario. And just as quickly as it was introduced, it was gone replaced by a world that was decidedly more video gamey than the last. 
The purpose of Donkey Kong Country 2's design was lost on me. Combined with the fact that I was trying to play a 2D platformer on a keyboard, not really my favored method of input, I felt little motivation to continue playing past the first couple of worlds and put it down without much of a second thought. But as we all know, time changes a person. More years went by. I was older and more appreciative of change in the intricacies of game design. My nostalgia for the original game was very much still intact, but I was more open to trying something new. Everything changed when a dear friend challenged me to a race from the beginning of Donkey Kong Country 2 to the end, an event that changed the way I engaged with video games forever. Not one to back down from a challenge, I took it upon myself to not just finally play DKC2, but to play it repeatedly in preparation for the race. And ironically, being forced to play it was what completely shifted my perspective. Because really, Donkey Kong Country 2 is a response to the successes and failures of its prologue's gameplay and needs to be experienced fully to really appreciate it. In what was surely a bold move for the company, the series' main protagonist was cut from just about everything but the title, shifting from hero to damsel in distress. For the sake of gameplay, it was a good move because Donkey Kong's niche would be more than filled by this new character, one whose own niche better complemented Diddy. Dixie Kong covered anything DK did better than Diddy and then some. What I particularly love about her hair twirl is the fact that it serves as both a crutch for new players and a tool for navigating certain levels faster than Diddy. But make no mistake, Diddy is just as important a character as he ever was, running, jumping, and climbing faster than Dixie. Through the implementation of its playable characters, DKC2 achieves a sense of balance unmatched by any other game in the series, demonstrating how the developers doubled down on that original vision Males described. Not only are enemies placed to take full advantage of the roll attack's momentum boost, they're arranged to facilitate the flow of the platforming, and cheap moments meant to catch the player off guard are replaced by enemies that actually telegraph their attacks, allowing you to adapt in real time. Barring a single auto-scrolling level, there aren't any significant portions of the game that deliberately try to disrupt the pace. And while I initially struggled to connect with the level design due to its abandonment of the iconic themes established in the original game, I've since come around after realizing that this new approach simply serves the gameplay better than Donkey Kong Island could have. It's certainly much more imaginative than the original game foregoing the usual jungles and caves for levels where you climb the mast of a pirate ship, free fall from the top to bottom of a gigantic beehive, or blaze through a death-defying roller coaster as you hang on for dear life. There's a clear focus on implementing more variety into the level design, which is particularly evident by the abundance of stages featuring vertical design and rope climbing that feels so much more natural on a pirate ship and in a castle than it does on a cliff face. While the theming doesn't progress as naturally from world to world as it did in Donkey Kong Country, the levels themselves feel like a natural habitat for all the little design quirks the developers wanted to implement and iterate on. And perhaps I'm biased, because I've now played through it countless times. Maybe I'm unaware of some of its more frustrating elements or I'm able to look past them because of my experience. The point is, this game was intentionally designed to make players feel this way. It's unlike any other platformer I've played and the only one that comes close is already my favorite game. A game whose impact of design I'm not even sure was intentional. It's funny to think about how quickly I fell in love with Donkey Kong Country 2, and in a lot of ways, it feels similar to my experience playing Super Mario 64. That is, years of apathy followed by a defining moment that made me appreciate the quirks of its design that make it unlike anything else I've ever played. But unlike my time playing Mario, appreciating how a game could implement both a low skill floor and a high skill ceiling so harmoniously, my outlook towards DKC2 was particularly narrow-minded. In preparation for that race, I grinded for weeks in order to cement what I thought was an edge over the competition. Instead of seeking or accepting help, I stubbornly played the way I wanted to, resulting in one fatal flaw. I maintained a solid lead for much of the race up until the final boss, at which point I choked, repeatedly. In my hubris, I neglected to prepare for perhaps the one leg of the race I really needed to practice. And rightfully, I got my shit kicked in. I can laugh looking back at that implosion now, but I was heated in the moment. 
It was embarrassing to fail so tremendously after not only practicing for weeks, but being built up as the favorite, the man to beat. In the end, with all due respect to my fellow competitors, I didn't feel like I was bested by someone simply outplaying me. I lost to myself, and that sucked. If this were any other game, I think I would have dropped it entirely after such a tragic failure. Instead, something about the game and the way I lost fueled me to continue grinding, so I played more and more and more until I simply couldn't. I played the game in such a specific way for so long that stopping to consider applying a different strategy or just taking a moment to more carefully appreciate the painstakingly crafted environment within the game physically hurt me. I knew I was neglecting certain aspects, but I could not bring myself to engage with them, eventually moving on when I felt I had nothing else to gain. And this ended up setting a dangerous trend in the way I've engaged with video games over the last couple of years. While games like Super Mario 64 and Overwatch have ultimately resulted in net positives for me, there were times spent playing them that were overwhelmingly toxic because of my obsession with becoming the best. There was seriously a time where I couldn't bring myself to play an uncompetitive video game just for a couple of hours. I had to grind, I had to be the best, I couldn't just have fun. I'll be honest with you, I don't have as much to say about Donkey Kong Country 3 as I do the previous entries in the series because it is largely unremarkable in terms of progress. Following the trend set by the previous game, DKC3 introduces another playable character to mixed reception, this time in place of Diddy. The addition of Kitty Kong makes DKC feel more like a return to the pace of the original game, this time with the added benefits of a more substantially fleshed out bonus system because almost everything he can do serves a relatively niche purpose, finding bonus barrels. It's certainly a much slower paced game than Donkey Kong Country 2, focused on facilitating variety through gimmicks that show up for a level or two before never being seen again. But I still love it because it helped me learn to love video games again. At the start of this year, I realized how much grinding something out for hundreds of hours was negatively affecting how I engage with gaming. And as a result, I started a spreadsheet to track what I was playing and when I completed it with the hope that playing more games would recapture my love of playing just for fun. And the first game I decided to play was Donkey Kong Country 3. I purposefully played at a slower pace because I wanted to approach the game differently than I did its predecessor, that is, to not get stuck into another grind sesh. But it was surprisingly easy to do just that because DKC3 really wants you to explore. Acting almost as a precursor to the next generation's 3D platformers, it dramatically improved perhaps the one feature established by the original that remained untouched in its sequel, the world map. It feels more like an early version of the hub worlds that snuck their way into just about every 3D platformer on the Nintendo 64 after Super Mario 64 paved the way, and it's chock full of its own secrets. While I didn't end up completing DKC3 100%, I felt more compelled to engage with the one core aspect of the Donkey Kong Country games I was neglecting, exploration. Then it hit me. In a rush to be the best and satiate this fixation I had, I skipped over almost half of the game that made me a speedrunner. So after finishing DKC3, I went back to its predecessor to right that wrong, and it made me realize something. In a way, Donkey Kong Country 2 is even closer in resemblance to Super Mario 64 than I already thought, not literally, but in an abstract sort of way. The original Donkey Kong Country secrets weren't super fleshed out. They were definitely fun to stumble upon, but over the course of the game lost their impact as the rewards never exceeded a bunch of bananas or extra lives. The implementation of bonuses was dramatically improved in DKC2 because they gave you more game to play. An entire secret world I had not touched in the countless hours spent perfecting the only playstyle I was interested in. On this playthrough, I stopped to smell the roses a bit, spending more time searching for every last sprinkle of content I could find before putting my skills to the test in the tough as nails lost world. And it felt so damn good to finally sink Crocodile Isle once and for all. I've had this picture on my wall for months, a gift from a friend who loves the Donkey Kong Country games just as much as I do. 
And yet for years, I was too stubborn to actually experience this moment for myself. Taking in the breathtaking sunset with my favorite characters in all of gaming, I finally realized what truly makes Donkey Kong Country 2 one of the greatest games I've ever played. It strikes such an amazing balance between allowing high skilled players to blaze through levels with insane momentum while making a slower, more exploration driven pace that can be appreciated by players uninterested in the intricacies of movement and methodical platforming just as fun. The same way my favorite game allows both playstyles to coexist through its impeccable movement options and incredibly open level design. At this point, I don't know how else to illustrate how much I love Donkey Kong Country. The original trilogy is a prolific series of games known for pushing the genre forward in unconventional ways while carving out its own style. Whether it's conveying an unexpected sense of realism, perfecting an already sublime gameplay style, or creating a real, explorable world within the confines of a 2D platformer, each of them accomplished something special. Some more than others, but still special all the same. Part of me wishes I was able to experience all three in succession as a child, the same way I did the original, so that I could feel a more balanced level of fondness for each. But what I've come to realize is that playing them the way I did has allowed me to garner a deeper understanding of why I love video games. And what I love above all else is when a game provides a solid challenge in a world that is as fun to experience the first time as it is the second, or the third, or the tenth, or the hundredth. I can't help but feel that the Donkey Kong Country trilogy as a whole exemplifies that kind of experience. And what is more powerful than my nostalgia for the original is the fact that I'm able to look at a series of relatively similar games and see different pieces of myself within each of them. Within Donkey Kong Country, I see a young, impressionable child that was simply blown away by a game that felt like an otherworldly blend of the toys he played with and the world he lived in but could only experience through TV and picture books. Within Diddy's Conquest, I see a stubborn, critical, and certainly more competitive late adolescent struggling internally while seeking a solid challenge as a form of escape. And in Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, I see the person I am now. One who has come to terms with their past insecurities, ready to actually live the life they've wanted for so long, but were too stunlocked in their own fear to actually do it. The production of this video would not have been possible without the help of my lovely Patreon supporters you see here on screen. If you'd like to support the channel while receiving early access to videos along with a bunch of extra bonus content, consider checking out my page by clicking the link on screen or in the description. Thank you so much for your support, and I can't wait to see you again in the next one.